My experience on becoming leader of the party was, it was a step into the unknown of a world I'd heard about. Heard about the power of the establishment. And Chris Mullin was only half joking when he contacted me and said, read a very British coup, because it's happening already. Under my leadership, the party produced two manifestos which would begin the process of redistribution of power and wealth in Britain, that would begin the process of bringing public service monopolies into public ownership, that would rebuild the National Health Service as a publicly run and publicly owned service, as well as giving hope to people through a green industrial revolution, giving hope to people through a foreign policy based on peace, on justice, on human rights and democracy, rather than going to war on behalf the United States all the time. Many vested interests in Britain didn't want any of this. Many global interests didn't want this. I was individually attacked by significant global leaders. Prime Minister Modi, President Trump, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I was attacked by unnamed sources in the senior civil service. Likewise, when senior generals said, again unnamed, we will not allow him to become Prime Minister, I don't know who it was that made those remarks directly to journalists knowing full well they'd be reported. And when a group of soldiers were undertaking target practice against a photograph of me, I was told I shouldn't worry about it, it was just normal behaviour in the army. Sorry, is it normal behaviour to put the photograph of the leader of the opposition up on a target to be shot at? It shows a general attitude amongst very senior figures in the worlds of finance, of security, of foreign policy, of economic management that doesn't want a redistribution of power and wealth in our society. It is actually quite comfortable with the fact we've got more food banks than branches of McDonald's, that we now have the most unequal country anywhere in Europe and getting worse. During my leadership of the party, I suffered more sustained personal abuse than any other leader of any political party has ever suffered. The bias against every policy that we put forward, knowing full well that those policies were themselves popular. The media in Britain is dominated by two factors. One is the billionaire ownership of all of the major papers, or the self-censorship by the so-called liberal media as well, who are more interested in kowtowing to what they perceive to be the British establishment than they are standing up against it the media is serving its function, which is to maintain the status quo within our society. The attacks on democracy by Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, Erdogan, so many other forces around the world are well reported in the mainstream liberal media, like The Guardian, like The New York Times. Yet. Those same papers are remarkably silent on the attacks on democracy within the Labour Party. We were a 600,000 member party, the largest political party in Europe, but we've become obsessed with suspending members, with expelling members, with closing down debate and closing down discussion. Where are the liberal media in speaking out against this? They are failing in their duty as journalists. I love this sort of movable feast of what's moderate, what's extreme, and what's left, and what's right. I don't think there's anything extreme in calling for monopolies of gas, water, mail, rail, and electricity to be taken into public ownership so we get the benefits, the profits, and indeed the workers get properly treated in them, and they deliver the service rather than the profit source for distant hedge funds. I don't think there's anything particularly extreme about that. I don't think there's anything very extreme about saying that we will abolish all university tuition fees and make education free from cradle to grave, so that we will abolish nursery fees for two-year-olds and above, as well as making higher and further education free. I think that, to me, is a sensible way forward for any democratic society to ensure everyone is able to fulfill the best potential that they can. I don't think there's anything extreme in a green industrial revolution which invests in renewable energy, invest in green industrial jobs in order to reduce pollution and improve biodiversity and play our part in carrying out the targets of COP26 from Glasgow last year. I don't see anything very extreme in that. I don't see anything very extreme in saying that the super rich will be taxed in order to pay for services for the rest. I don't think anything extreme in that at all. But somehow or other, that's painted as extreme. And when 
somebody talks about adherence to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, talks about peace around the world as being the fundamental objective of government, I'm told that is tantamount to running up the white flag against any of our enemies and aggressors. We live in a world that is damaging itself through inequality, injustice, poverty, pollution and war. Surely we can do better than that. And just to label those that propose something different as some or other mad extremists who are um, a danger to our society just shows the poverty of the ambition of those media outlets in doing that. But they do it for a purpose. They're there to protect the injustice and protect the inequality. My policy is to stick to what you believe in and argue corner and argue the case and listen. Listen to people about what their genuine concerns are and be prepared to engage with people, sometimes in very uncomfortable conversations. But those uncomfortable conversations make both sides of that discussion better and stronger as a result of it. Running away from those conversations never works. If you want to live in a democratic society, you have to defend those that you don't agree with as well as those that you do agree with. And that is surely what democracy is about. Democracy and the power of accountability. That is what brings about social change. Did those that were killed at Peterloo die in vain? Did the toll puddle martyrs get deported and eventually some brought back in vain? The Chartists might not have won when they marched into London, but 70 years later, most of their demands had been met. Did those that dared to dream about the idea of socialization of health, free health care for all, against the most ridiculous opposition of entrenched vested interests possible? On a global scale, did those that march for civil rights in the southern states of the USA do so for no purpose? They did it with immense bravery. History shows us that change comes from the bravery of the oppressed standing up against the oppressor. Surely this is what our children need to be learning. The power of demanding accountability, the power of demanding social change to bring about real justice, that is what power is really about. This is the traditional moment during an interview where we have a word from our sponsors. The only problem is there aren't any sponsors to give us a word. You, all of you, are the sponsors for Double Down News. So go online, join up, support Double Down News. It's actually genuinely very independent. Join Double Down News on Patreon.